Welcome to In Conversation. Today we have with us David Porson. David is an internationally renowned Bible teacher. His teachings have been a blessing to tens of thousands, if not millions of people. He is also a prodigious author. He has written over 40 books and they have been published in 120 countries of the world. We're so pleased to have you with us this morning, David. You were telling me before we came on air about how you came to write all your books. How, how did it come about? I never wanted to write a single book. I had neither the intention nor the desire to do so. But when I began a traveling ministry in 1982, I picked up burdens in my heart for the churches I visited. Mm. In some cases, there were things there that shouldn't be. In other cases, there were things that shouldn't be there that were. And so I developed these burdens and began to share them with pastors and ministers in fraternal meetings. And I thought this is a very inefficient way of sharing a burden. I could spend the rest of my life in a jumbo jet just sharing one burden around the world. I said, Lord, there must be a more efficient way of sharing a burden. And I opened my Bible at Jeremiah 30, and there it was staring me in the face. Write everything in a book that I have told you, said the Lord. And I said, Lord, you don't want me to write books, do you? And he said, yes, get on with it. Well, I have with me one of your books, which mm. uh, I, I got you to sign last night. I, it's a bit battered and bruised at the moment because I've read it so often and it's been such a blessing to me. And it's on the subject of when Jesus returns. Right. Let me start right at the very beginning. Why is Jesus coming back a second time? The answer is because he hasn't finished the work he came to do. He's only done half the work that God sent him to do on his first visit. People talk about his finished work. Well, only half of it is finished, mm -hmm. and there's a lot more for him to do. The book of Acts begins with the statement, the former treatise, namely Luke's Gospel, was written to show all that Jesus began to do and to teach, implying that there's a whole lot more and certainly, by way of expectancy on the Jewish nation, he didn't come up to their hopes. And he will on the second visit. But this has created a real problem for the Jews. Why didn't he set up his kingdom on the first visit? Why didn't he take the world over? Why didn't he bring peace and justice to the whole world? Why didn't he stop wars? Why didn't he... So many questions. Mm. Well, he didn't because he had something that he had to do before that would enable those things to happen. And what he had to do first was to save individuals and get them put right. You can't put the world right until you've put individuals mm. right to mm. inhabit it. And so he achieved that on his first visit by dying for them. And unfortunately, far too many Christians are stuck on that personal salvation, which was the purpose of the first visit. But he's got far more to do. He's going to present the whole world back to his Father, the whole world, and a world of peace and prosperity and, and health and happiness. And he hasn't done that yet. And many people say, well, Obviously, he can't be a full saviour because he hasn't been able to save the world. It's as in as, as big a mess as it's ever been. He's got to save the world, and he will do that on his second visit. But he had to begin to save individuals on the first, or he'd have no one in the new world when he saved it. He's going to save creation. He's going to redeem the entire planet Earth and the outer space. Mm. That's what he's come to redeem and to save. But I think the real problem is that we're not teaching clearly that he's come to save the world and creation, mm. the whole thing. And he hasn't completed that far from it. The world is still, as the Bible says, in the hands of the devil. 
And uh, that's got to be dealt with and will be at his second coming. But most people believe he's coming again, but have no real understanding as to what he's coming back to do. Another fundamental question which yes. people often ask is, is it a literal personal return? Absolutely, yes. It's more than that. It's a, a bodily return. Mm. He's coming back in the same way that he left and to the same place. And so uh, the Jesus we shall see is the Jesus they said goodbye to 2,000 years ago. I'd like us to read some verses from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning of verse 1. And I'll read them to you. And then I'll ask you a question, and I'd like you to give me the opportunity okay. to respond to that question. But concerning the times and the season, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord comes as a thief in the night. Now, the question which I'd like to pose to you, and I, I guess many viewers would, would want to ask you this, this seems to suggest that Jesus will come back like a thief in the night. In other words, he can come back at any moment, and therefore we need to be prepared for him coming back at any moment. Is that what you believe the Bible teaches? There are clear verses that say he will come like a thief in the night. And then immediately in the context, you'll find a statement that that is how it will happen to some but not others. To those who are alert and watching and aware of the signs of the times, it will not be like that. We shall be awake, alert. Time and again, Jesus said, watch. He didn't say, I'll be coming at any moment. And they asked him, but what will be the signs of your approach? How will we know it's getting near? And he gave a straight answer and gave them at least four major signs on that occasion. He said, watch for these signals, and you'll know that I'm approaching, not be ready for me at any moment. What do you see as the problem with this any moment now theory? It's a problem because it focuses people on the wrong things. It, it treats them as if panic is the motivation. Oh, he might come this minute. I must be ready. That's panic. And the focus in the New Testament is not on what we're doing when he comes back, but on what we've been doing while he's been away for a long time. And Jesus told parable after parable, the wise and foolish virgins, the parable of the talents, in which the key character is away for a long time. And the real test of that is whether people get into mischief when they think he's not coming back soon. When Jesus gets back, we shall give an account of not what we're doing because we thought he was coming back, but what we've been doing while he was away. He wants to be able to say, well done, good and faithful servant. You talked in your last answer about signs yes. pointing to the return of Jesus. What exactly are those signs? Well, let's start with just one passage. In Matthew 24, they had asked him, the disciples said, what will be the signals, the signs of your coming? And he told them four clear signs and told them not to be deceived by people who started rumors. He said, trust your eyes, not your ears. And that's why there's a lot of confusion today. People are trusting their ears instead of their eyes. He said the first sign will be in the world, second sign will be in the church, third sign will be in the Middle East, and the fourth sign will be in the sky. What could be clearer than that? And then he tells you in detail what will be happening in the world first, in the church, in the Middle East, and in the sky. And of those signs, only one and a half are visible today. Which are? The first signs in the world are clearly here. The signs in the church are coming very quickly. Signs in the Middle East haven't appeared at all, and the signs in the sky not at all. 
And it's only with all those things. Jesus said, when you see all these things, you know that I'm just the other side of the door. One of the big issues uh, with regards to the Left Behind movie is it says that the Christians are raptured out and then there is the great tribulation. The uh, word for the study of the last things, as they call it, is eschatology, mm -hmm. from eschaton, the last things. Yes. I call this picture and its theology escapology. It's offering people an escape from the big trouble. And it's no wonder it's become so popular, quite mm. frankly. If you fear being in such a terrible time of trouble and you're told Jesus will get you out of it before it happens, you'll grasp that as readily as anything. And I believe that's the biggest danger. I believe there will be a rapture, but after the big trouble, I believe there will come a time when God's people are gathered to meet Christ in the air. And it will mean many left behind. The trouble with the film is it puts the left behind at the wrong time. There will be a left behind when the people of Christ are gathered to meet him. So tell us a little bit about the big trouble as you refer to it, the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation will happen on a universal scale. It is happening locally to Christians. Uh, equally bad things are happening. Martyrdoms are taking place right now while we talk. Every 15 minutes, a Christian is dying for the faith. But that's not the tribulation, which will be worldwide mm. and will involve a worldwide leadership of a, an unholy trinity. We know the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, but the unholy trinity is Satan, Antichrist, and the false prophet. Mm. There's a kind of correspondence there. Satan is wanting the Father's place. Antichrist will try and imitate Christ. And the false prophet will try and bring prophecies from an unholy spirit. So there's an unholy trinity going to be running the world. And in the last seven years, which is how long the Great Tribulation will last, they will be in charge for the first three and a half years, the first half of it. And they will bring peace and security to people, which is what they're wanting. And so there'll be a false sense of peace and security, which is the biggest deception there'll ever be. And one of the major things Jesus said at every stage of that big trouble, don't be deceived. Don't let your ears lead you astray. Just keep watching. You believe that Christians will go through this big trouble. Absolutely. Is it possible that it could be this generation? It could be any generation. Yeah. Uh, but whatever if I don't live to see the big trouble, I need to be prepared for suffering already. So how do we prepare ourselves for suffering? Very simply, you prepare for suffering by living a blameless life. That's how you prepare for it. And then as the Peter says in his letter, don't suffer because you've been doing wrong. Suffer for doing right. Now I'm going to ask a question which really troubled me as a young Christian. Right. Uh, and, and I'm sure viewers are thinking the same question. Will, will we in Britain and those of us who are in Australia know at the same time that Jesus has returned? And how is that possible? <laughs> Strange that you should ask this in a television studio, well. <laughs> in a television age when the slightest things that happens anywhere yeah. we know about immediately yeah. while it's happening. But regardless of that, there will first of all be a worldwide sign. That fourth sign he gave them was that the sun and the stars will stop shining. Now who's going to miss that? The sun and stars will stop shining. 
No light at all, day or night, worldwide. Who won't know that? And then the Son of Man, the sign of His coming, will be like lightning, sheet lightning from east to west. You're very excited about it, very animated about it. Yeah. You know, why, why do so few preachers preach about the second coming? Well, because I don't think they've really grasped why he's coming. They haven't really grasped that personal salvation is only part of the job. Do we make it more complicated than it needs to be sometimes? Probably, in our muddled thinking, yes. Yeah. But I think the real problem is that we're not teaching clearly that he's come to save the world and creation, mm. the whole thing. And he hasn't completed that, far from it. The world is still, as the Bible says, in the hands of the devil. In the book of Revelation, chapter 20, which is between all the big trouble in detail and this new heaven and the new earth, is a thousand years of proper rule of this world mm -hmm. and universal peace. And that's when they're going to turn their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. That's a hope for this world, and that's the hope connected to Jesus coming. He's coming back to this earth to establish the kingdom here. Now, what he did on his first visit was enable individuals to get ready to live in his kingdom. And therefore, on an individual scale, we can enter the kingdom now and live as we're going to live when everybody will have to live in the kingdom of Christ. And it is that that is the heart of his second coming. And that's where the Christian hope lies, that one day everybody will be under his kingdom, his kingship and every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. And that's why he's come to this earth. He's come to get it all back for the Father and present it back to God, his Father, and say, here it is, I've, I've got it all back for you. What sort of role will Christians have in, in this millennium reign? Well, they're writing their CV now that's the heart of being ready for his return, that you are qualified for a job in his kingdom yeah. and that he's looking for reliable, faithful, good servants who know how to be good citizens of the kingdom. Yeah. That takes time, we're learning, but we're getting ready to take over the government of the world. We need a lot of practice at getting into, we will be in his government provided we're under his government and therefore will be over the nations of the world. That needs a lot of preparation. And uh, I get excited about this world being so much at peace that all the money spent on armaments can be spent feeding the hungry and clothing the naked. The sad thing is that after a thousand years, of peace and health and prosperity, people will still be in a rebellious mood against Christ and will eagerly respond to the last ditch appeal of Satan to get rid of the government of Christ. And that will bring about the end of the millennium as well. Most churchgoers' idea of the future is, I go to heaven when I die, full stop. That's all they've been told. Mm. And far too many funeral services have implied that. Um, first, as I've said, we don't go to heaven, we're already there. Our spirits are already there, and we should be conscious of that. And secondly, we don't get a new body until some time later. And we don't get our new body until everybody else does. Mm including people like Abraham and Isaac mm. and Jacob and all the Old Testament saints. All together, we shall get our new bodies. And we get those new bodies actually to live here. 
We don't get them up into heaven, we get them down here. And at the second coming, it says Jesus is going to bring with him all the saints who've gone to heaven already. Heaven will be emptied on the day Jesus gets back. They're all coming back here. There'll be viewers today who basically are in a lot of pain. They're getting old. Yes. They're losing their hearing. Their sight is going. I've got hearing. Yeah, aids, yeah, yeah. And, and they, 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 they're feeling a little bit sorry for themselves. Okay. What is this doctrine of the resurrection uh, you know, have to say an encouragement to us? Well, simply that I expect to be 33 again. I can look forward to that. And Paul says that when you're through the pain and the suffering of old age, it will seem like a dream. <laughs> yeah. The Bible talks about the New Jerusalem. Yes. Is that a physical place? We're now in that last stage, not the millennium. We're no, yeah. way into the new heaven yeah. and the new earth. When the Lord says, behold, I make everything new, everything, all things. And there will be a new city this time whose architect and builder is God. And Abraham, 4,000 years ago, was quite content with a tent in his old age, having left a brick-built house in Ur of the Chaldees. Mm. He lived in a tent in his old age because he was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. And that city is described in as near language as we can get when we think about something so amazing and so future as being 1,500 miles cubed, like the Holy of Holies was cubed in Jerusalem, a holy city, 1,500 miles in each dimension and made of the most amazing pure materials. There was a, a jeweler in Manchester years ago, handled precious stones. And when he read the book of Revelation, he thought, I wonder if I could say something about that. And he knew about pure light already. Cross-polarized light had been invented. And he shone this on all the precious stones that he handled. And he discovered that some of them become black as coal. Others become all the colors of the rainbow, most beautiful things. And whatever color they were at the beginning, under pure light, they were all the colors of the rainbow. So, for example, um, diamond have no color at all in pure light. They look like a lump of coal. And so there are no diamonds in the holy city. <laughs> but every precious stone in the holy city he discovered turns into the colors of the rainbow in pure light. Yes. And none of the other stones do. And he thought, how did John the Apostle know 2,000 years ago he thought that's proof that the Bible is inspired because God knew he made those stones. In other words, even the very materials of the New Jerusalem are precious to us here and very rare to us here, but plentiful there, always in pure light. It's a real place made of real material. There's a real river running through it. And it's real people populating it. And it's bodies. real people but it's people who have been made fit for it. And I think that's a very important point as we're finished. And that is that the whole purpose of being saved as an individual is to get you ready for that world. If we went as we are, we'd ruin it mm -hmm. very quickly. We'd poison, we'd pollute it, we'd do to the new world just what we've done to this world. And therefore, salvation is not an instantaneous moment. It's a process of being changed into the glory of God until we are fit to enter a new world without spoiling it. That's what salvation is about. I'm not saved yet.
I've begun to be. I'm on the way of salvation, to use biblical language. Or as Paul said, we are nearer to our salvation than when we first believed. People have forgotten that salvation is future as well as past. I'm not saved yet, but I'm on the way. Now, my wife has a lot more faith than I have in many ways, and she really believes. But there's one thing I teach that she finds very hard to accept. And it's when I tell her that one day her husband will be perfect. And she said to me once, if I built my faith on experience, I couldn't believe it, but I'll try and build it on the promises of God. David, we want to thank you. You've brought to us some new insights into this whole area of the second coming of Jesus. Thank you. 